um, it goes to Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And it could go to my website, but we haven't really got it set up. So the thing is, it circles, and I never know when I'm live until somebody tells me. So. Well, it says that we're live on my screen. Great. So Perfect. I think we might be live. I just like, yay, yay. <laughs> hey, everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ. And this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. We have an amazing story today. If you don't know this guy, you will know him very soon. And he does almost a daily show, five day a week show that's fantastic with PCRM. It's called The Exam Room. He is also known as the Weight Loss Champion. And I hope he'll tell the story of how he got that name. His name is Chuck Carroll. And he once weighed almost 300 pounds than he weighs now. It's hard to believe because he's really good looking and he's got an amazing voice that you're going to love listening to. Please welcome to the show, Chuck Carroll. I'm so happy to talk to you. Oh, wow. What an introduction, man. That, that, woo, we, <laughs> I'm flustered after that one. It's hard to believe, Chuck, that we're, you're five, six, right? Uh, on a good day, five, five is what it says. Yeah, on my so you and me are about the same height and you once weighed 300 pounds more than me. I mean, I just, I can't believe it because you look so fit and so trim. I mean, I'm sure you're telling the truth. Maybe you have a picture we could see somewhere, but you have, you have such an inspirational story because, you know, I host something called the truth about weight loss summit. And you're going to be a, 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 you know, a, a speaker for the next year. And it's, I mean, weight loss is hard, but weight maintenance is even harder apparently. And you are truly a success story. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, I, I, I agree with that assessment 100%. Uh, weight loss is hard, but it's also something everybody can do. But where we get tripped up so many times is, you know, how to keep it off. For whatever reason, it just seems like we reward ourselves with weight loss with the same foods that put us in that hole in the first place. And that just starts that whole vicious cycle all over again. For whatever reason, it absolutely, absolutely. And that's where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? The, the maintenance part. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, and, and we can get into this a little bit later, but I call that my one nacho theory, my one nacho and, and that like a whole diet can be derailed by one nacho. Well, you see what I like about you. And, and this is the thing, cause there's so many wonderful doctors that teach plant-based nutrition, weight loss, but they've never been obese like us. And they don't understand that for a lot of us, abstinence is really required, not just for our maintenance, but for our sanity. And that, that thing about bet you can't eat just one for us, it's true. Cause if we could have eaten just one, wouldn't we have done it already? Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah, that I mean, forget Nike's just do it. The bet you can't eat just one is perhaps the most brilliant marketing campaign ever because that is so true for so many of us. You eat one, then you got to eat another and another and another. And before you know it, all of those chips are gone. All of the chips are gone and you still want more. That's the funny thing about it. And the thing is, is what got me more upset, even though that I, I was able to do that, is that the food was designed to do that. It's like they knew go, they were designing something that would do that to people that were sensitive to, to the effect of food addiction. Oh, yeah. You know, if you close your eyes, you can really visualize these mad food scientists in the basement of some big building, you know, just crafting the perfect recipe to get you hooked, whether it's the fat, the salt, the oil, the sugar, whatever the case may be. And then you put that in the perfect proportions and they're like, yep, we got something here that's just as good as tobacco. And they put it out there and they market it to adults. They market it to kids. And in my estimation, I know that this sounds a little bit extreme and a little bit controversial, but food, those types of foods can be just as deadly as a cigarette, as any tobacco product. And there are statistics to back that up if you look at the number of deaths related to chronic diet-related diseases. So, you know, on the surface, if you're not kind of in this health bubble that you and I operate in, and you're just kind of like hearing somebody say that, that, that guy is so full of it. He's such, you know, he's got these extreme wacky values, but then no. You, you go to any government website, the, the CDC, NIH, whatever the case may be, and you pull up the prevalence, the statistics on these diseases and, and how they are related to what it is that we're fueling our bodies with. And it is right there in black and white, irrefutable data. And, and it's just crazy to me why, why we aren't yet viewing food um, in that light, or at least not nearly as many of us are as view tobacco uh, as the cancer causing agent that it is. Well, thanks to your work and my work and other people that are taking this seriously, people are beginning to believe that this is really a thing. You know, so many of these people like, you know, they're, they're celebrities and they have diet books and diets and they really were never really overweight and they designed these diets with cheat days. That is the stupidest thing in the world. 
Mm-mm. No, ma'am, cannot be doing a cheat day because a cheat day is the end of the line. That is when I, I'm telling you. So I have had this weight off for 11 years. And I fear that if I ever have that cheat day, those 11 years, however long it may be, will be completely erased. And that does go back to that one nacho theory. Because I think back to the previous diets that I did have. And I, I thought, hey, chef, I, I thought that I had this licked. I thought I had it down cold and there was nothing that could prevent me from putting the weight back on. So I thought I could have just this one nacho. I could handle it. It wouldn't be a problem. So I took the nacho and I dipped it in the nacho cheese and I took a bite and I was like, mm, I've been missing this. Yes, indeed. But then what happened? That nacho was gone. I went back and I got that other nacho and it's that bet you can't eat just one thing. And so that one cheat day just sets you back so far. And, and for whatever reason, there is a large percentage of us who just can't have those cheat days. I don't well, prescribe them for anybody. Yeah. Well, I don't think it's necessarily good for anyone, but, but you have to know yourself because that's, I think that's the most important thing. There's a self-professed food addict named Kay Shepard. She's not vegan, but she's done some really great work in this field. And she always says, one bite too many, a thousand bites, never enough. Mm. Yeah, uh, man, that's that's perfect. That is that is absolutely perfect. Um, and why yeah. would we think? You know, here's the thing. I think people don't like the word addict. They just don't. It conjures up like some guy in the alley shooting up heroin. They, <laughs> and, and so nobody wants to be any kind of an addict. But think about it. With alcoholism, I think people know that once you're sober, you don't take that first drink. There's a saying: one drink, one drunk, one nacho. Yeah. <laughs> one nacho, one size more jeans, and then another, and then another size up, and then another size up. And I think that that the funny thing, though, is I honestly think that at a certain point, you know, somebody who has a serious substance abuse problem, whether it be with drugs or alcohol, as much as they will deny it um, outwardly, internally, I, I would have to think that they recognize that there is, in fact, a major issue and they know that something's wrong. But I think that it takes somebody who's morbidly obese and addicted to food, it takes them longer to realize that they are in fact addicted to it. Because food uh, also, I think a big part of it is there has not been that taboo with food that there is from drugs. You think about it, growing up in school, they have all of these drug abuse resistance education programs. And so you learn about the dangers of alcohol and substance abuse in those programs, but nobody is saying, don't eat that Twinkie. As as a matter of fact, they're probably giving you a Twinkie to eat while they're teaching you to not take drugs. But the thing is, they're essentially just handing you a joint right along with it and say, hey, smoke up, but let's not, you know, let, let's not talk about food here. We're going to talk about heroin. Ah, it's the same daggone thing. You know, before the pandemic, I was volunteering in schools, grammar schools with my dog, Bailey, doing some kind of thing called pet therapy and humane education. And if I was there for snack time, which is between breakfast and lunch, they would give them uh, they would give them cheese, like string cheese. They would give them a juice box and they would give them some either chips or a cookie. And this is what they're giving to young kids for their nutrition break. There's, why do they call it a nutrition break when they're not giving them nutrition? I, the, and, you know, that's, that's a perfect question. And I, I always just, I have such strong internal dialogue with myself, almost wrestling, you know, um, whether or not I should speak up and say something when I you know, witness this, that kind of stuff happening, knowing, you know, how risky of a behavior that actually is that people are just oblivious to. But then I also know that if I speak up at that time in that manner, as powerful as that can be, it, the message is going to be like so far out of left field, they're going to immediately dismiss it and cast you as, you know, just somebody who's absolutely insane. Um, so I, I would love to figure out the perfect way to introduce that kind of stuff in the most random of situations like that. Um, I mean, is that something that you, you have thought about as well? Because I'm sure when you saw that, you had to bite your tongue. Yeah, well, we should maybe start a coalition, people like you and me that are survi obesity survivors, because I get, I, I get, uh, it's really weird because vet, there's no events right now. But before I was asked to speak very often at VegFest. And I'm thinking, why are you guys asking me when you know what I have to say, what my stand is? And I actually got kicked out of one of the VegFest once for, for basically saying that everything they had there was crap. They had no food. They had no, this is, if you have a VegFest, veg, vegan, vegetarian starts with V-E-G, vegetables. So why do you have a VegFest when there's no fruits and vegetables? And this was the Boston uh, Vegetarian Festival. It's one of the biggest ones. I think this was in 2000. 
2011. And she actually asked me to leave because I, all I did is I make a joke, I made a joke and I said, thank you for inviting me to speak at the Boston cupcake festival because they had seven cupcake vendors. <laughs> they had ice cream vendors. And, and, and then, and then see my, I feel like my own people, meaning the vegans, even though they gave me the, the award for a uh, hall of fame, don't like me because I talk about how bad that food is. And they say, oh, you're making it so hard for people to be vegan. Am I really? I'm making it easier for people to live healthy lives and not get caught in the pleasure trap. And I'm making it easier for people that are addicted to food not to go down that path. Because I got to tell you, I've never even tried all this stuff. I've never, I, I mean, I, I love meat. I've never tried any of the fake cheeses or the fake meats because these were developed after, you know, I became abstinent from junk food. Yeah. yeah. And that, that really is tough though. I mean, there are so many layers to veganism though. Not everybody goes vegan for their health. I mean, a lot of people do it for animal reasons and environmental reasons. And in that case, you know, those types of foods, those vegan cupcakes, no doubt that they're better on that front. But as far as, you know, what it is that you're doing to your body and the health, no, you're certainly not going to reap the benefits there. Um, and, and so it is a, a double-edged sword. And I think that the question then is like, well, why are you vegan? If it's not for yourself, if it's not for your health, then there's nothing you or I or anybody else could really say to kind of change their opinion. Um, and, and so that's that's difficult. But, you know, that is that is definitely one that I wrestle with. Uh, although I think it's hysterical that Chef AJ got thrown out of a veg fest. Oh my goodness that's gracious. Funny. I know that. I, I, you know, and I, and I was really kind of joking, you know, and they didn't like that. I said oil was bad in my lecture and they get, they, the year before they have Dr. Esselstyn, the year I was there, they had Dr. Greger. So it, it's like, then don't invite me. And you know, I mean, I'm not going to change my, what I'm going to say, you know, especially, and it's not like VegFest even pay anything. You know what I mean? So right. especially if I'm not getting paid, I'm going to for sure tell the truth. You know, you know what I always wanted to ask you, Chuck, you know, I, I we know that you had to get the, one of the gastric surgeries and weight loss surgeries. I'm not sure which one you can talk about it if you want. And I'm wondering, do you think if you had learned about some of this, you might not have, because you know, what I love about calorie density is it's sort of like gastric bypass in a way, because you, you make your food larger. So you're not making your stomach uh, smaller. Yeah. Um, that is a, a really good, good question. And it's, it's one that I'm not sure that I have a 100% answer for. I look at it in, in two lights. Um, one, knowing what I know now and the benefits of a plant-based diet and seeing all of these wonderful examples of, of people who have been able to do this without surgery and overcome and improve their health, I have no doubt that I could um, theoretically have been one of those people. Um, on the other hand, I was so, so addicted to food. I mean, we are talking a massive addiction to food that I really believe would have killed me within a number of years um, that I needed to do something extreme right that instant. And, and the thing that the surgery provides more than anything is this window where you cannot tolerate the fast food, the high fat food that brought you to the surgeon in the first place. Because if you eat that food at that point, you will become sicker than you have ever been in your entire life. And you will quite frankly, wish that you were dead. And I did not want to wish that I was dead. So uh, I, I abstained. And then over time, I just kind of realized like I've made it this far without it. Um, so I, 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 I don't need it any longer. So that is what I credit um, the surgery with is just providing me that window. Um, and, and so I, I don't have a solid yes or no answer to, to be perfectly honest with you. Theoretically, it's a yes, but it's, it's also with that big caveat of I do not, I do not regret my decision. But I think that a lot of people also think that weight loss surgery is an easy way out. Um, it's not. Uh, you, the thing is, if you go and you look at the statistics um, long term, I mean, I mean, the benefits of it are about equal to anybody that goes on, on a diet. You know, the the further out you are from that surgery, the more time that has elapsed between your surgery and present day, the more likely you are to have regained all of the weight back or a significant amount of it at least. There are people who are very close to me who have had this exact same procedure and have gained all of the weight back. You know, I've seen this countless times. And as a matter of fact, here's, here's the crazy thing about it though. This is what basically nobody realizes unless they've had it, is when you actually go in for these procedures, they tell you, if this one doesn't work, don't worry, we can go in and do what's called a revisionist surgery. As in we can, we can staple your stomach for a second time. 
And so I heard that in the consultation. And then two thoughts entered my mind again. One was, okay, they've just given me permission to go back and eat the way that I have been eating and I'll be okay. And then that second time, you know, I'll really have to clean up my diet. But then the other thought was, well, if this is really only a temporary solution, why are they billing it as this big, huge, magical cure? So I, I was wrestling. Do I really want to do this? But I was so desperate at that point that I just said, you know what? I'm going to do it. You know, I wonder, I, are you ever familiar with a show called My 600 Pound Life? Yeah, it's hard for me to watch that one. Yeah. Well, the reason I ask is on that particular show, the doctor requires the patient to lose 50 pounds before they have gastric bypass. Were you required to do that for your surgery or did they just do it straight up? They put me on a medically supervised diet to see if I could lose weight um, because I was so young. I was still in my mid twenties and insurance initially said, no way, we're not going to cover this. The guy's too young. And despite the fact that my blood pressure was like off the charts and, and I was just headed for an early grave, they were like, nope, too young. Put them on a medically supervised diet for six months. On that medically supervised diet, I found it impossible to stick to. And I actually wound up gaining weight um, while I was supposed to be on it. So um, they, they tried that with me, but I failed miserably, just like every other diet before then. It seems like you were the fast food king. Like for me, I just ate dessert. Like I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, I was obese. I, you know, weighed almost 200 pounds, but for me, it was just dessert. You seem to really like the fast food though. Oh, yes, yes, yes. As a matter of fact, I can uh, walk, uh, walk us through a little bit. I have some slides here um, that I like to share. Um, wait a minute. Host disabled participant screen sharing. I'm going to have to ask you to clean that one up. Wait a second. I wouldn't have done it on purpose. So it's where a, is I don't that? take these things personally. Yeah, it's my husband's Zoom. So where do I, <laughs> uh, let me just screen share. Uh, multiple, how about this? Does that help? Let's see here. Yeah. Hey, look at that. All right. It All right. So let's go ahead and share this. I'm going to pull this up. And um, so here we are. Taco Bell was my jam. Okay. I could not go a single day without going to Taco Bell. I mean, literally could not go a day because I would start to freak out mentally if I did not get my fast food fixed. Like I had a serious Jekyll and Hyde situation happening where uh, I was, you know, easy, easy, happy, go lucky, get along with kind of guy if I was, you know, stuffed. But if I wasn't getting that man, I was like, not the nicest guy in the world to be around to the point where like, I scared people. And I remember becoming so angry one particular night, a few days in um, to a diet trying to detox uh, off of fast food. I, I got up and I was just like feeling sick physically. I was angry emotionally. And I just, boom, I put my fist through a wall because I had not gotten Taco Bell in 72, 40, 48 to 72 hours. Like it was just, it, it, thinking about that now is insane. But the thing is you punch a wall, you're supposed to feel better. No, I pulled my fist out of the wall and then proceeded to put it through a door. And then a few hours later in the middle of the night, I still snuck out to the 24 hour drive through to get my fix. So let's talk about what it was that I would get. Let's add this all up, right? So I would get uh, two seven layer burritos. Then I would get two beef grilled stuffed burritos, which is, you know, you see how appetizing that looks present day, but back in the day, man, that was the ticket. Uh, a nachos bel grande, because what Mexican feast is complete without those nachos. Uh, then I would get a cheesy chicken quesadilla and then uh, two cheesy potato burritos, uh, which is nothing but essentially uh, fried potato wedges with chili and cheese wrapped in a tortilla. And then because I was such a good customer and, and they would literally just recognize my car when I pulled into the drive through I didn't even have to tell them what my order was. They were just like, hey, Chuck, your order's 20 bucks. Please pull through. By the way, here's a free caramel empanada. Thanks for being our number one customer. So the majority of the time, they were really cool about that, except for the one time when uh, the, <laughs> the lady on the other end of the board told me that I ate too much. That was, that was just kind of sad. Uh, but anyway, so if you add all this up, one trip to Taco Bell, 4,370 calories. Mind you, this is every single day. And uh, also had 196 grams of fat, more than 10,000 milligrams of sodium, and truly, this was a heart attack in a sack situation, but 
I mean, we, we, that, that was just dinner, you know, before that there was lunch at Boston market, which was a half of a chicken and three sides. One of which was cream spinach. And I always thought that this was a healthy meal because it was, it was a half of a chicken and chicken's healthy, right? Forget the fact that it's just greasy and, you know, probably full of fat. It was still a healthy meal because I had that. I had my cream spinach and a diet lemonade. So it must be healthy, right? Then I would always stop on the way home for a snack and I would get six things from 7-Eleven off of the rollers that they have by the register called taquitos. So I would get six of those. And then oftentimes I would also have pizza. We would always get these flyers in the mail for, um, you know, buy five pizzas for the office and get $10 off. So even though I was just one guy, I would order five pizzas at a time and just have a stash in the refrigerator. And, and when they would come, I would eat one or two pizzas and then let that digest and then make my trip to Taco Bell. So overall, on average, my daily caloric intake was 10,000 calories. And that's how by the age of 27, I got up to 420 pounds and had a 66 inch waist. And that waist was expanding very quickly to the point where within a year, I probably would have been too big to even shop out of a big and tall catalog. And at that point, I would have been housebound. So that is uh, that was a scary proposition. But then this is me uh, holding an actual pair of my old jeans when I was going and I gave a talk at this wonderful uh, plant-based restaurant uh, near Dulles Airport in the Washington, D.C. area uh, called Green Fair. So these are my old 66-inch jeans and uh, about three people could fit in there. And I I'm always curious when I talk to others who have lost a significant amount of weight to find out whether or not they realized just how large they were at that point. And I'm not asking this from a fat shaming perspective. I'm saying this more from the way that I used to kind of have these conversations with myself where I would say, well, okay, my friend, Joe, Joe only has a 33 inch waist and, and he's pretty small, right? So two, two small Joes is probably just a medium sized person, right? So 33 times two is 66. I'm 66. So I'm only a medium sized person. And these are the little things that I would tell myself to continue my food addiction. So you recognize kind of you have a problem, but, but you, you, you have these mind games, these tricks that you play on yourself to continue going down this unhealthy road. And I, I always wonder whether others who have walked this similar journey had those same types of conversations with themselves. Was that something that you wrestled with? No, you know, I think, I think you get to a point where you just don't think you're fat anymore because you get so used to it, you know, and, and it wasn't really, you know, until people, I mean, it's different. I, I don't know. Did people call you fat? Because they did call me fat all the time. It's because, especially because I was teaching vegan cooking and you wouldn't believe how you, I just, first of all, I don't understand how rude people are, you know, like in the middle of a class, this guy raised his hand. I think it was at Whole Foods. There were 77 people that I'll never forget. And I thought he was going to ask me something about a recipe. He goes, well, if the vegan diet's so good, why are you so fat? I mean, how do you answer that? You know, mm -hmm. I said, so I said, I don't know. It must've been something I ate. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, because you can't really attack the audience member because I, you know, then it's just, but I don't know. I think you just get so used to it. It's like just the way you neuro adapt to the taste of whole natural food. I think you kind of, because you don't wait, you don't wake up 420 pounds. It, it comes on kind of gradually, you know? Right. It, it, absolutely. And, and yeah, I, I did have my moments, but I also played into it um, because when I was really at my heaviest, I was still working in music radio at a radio station down here in the DC area, WBIG, fittingly enough, big 100.3. And so that was another thing that I used to continue <laughs> to, to eat, you know, as, as often as I possibly could, uh, because I, I, I told myself I could not be on air at big 100.3 if I wasn't big Chuck. And that's what they called me on the air, big Chuck. So I had to play into that persona. Um, and it, you know, it was, it was funny though, because one time, um, they came to me and they were like, well, we have this, this company that wants to advertise with you. Okay. And, and it's, it's called the cookie diet. Would you be interested in doing the cookie diet and, and, and losing weight and just giving your testimonial on the air? I was like, cool. You're going to pay me to lose weight. Absolutely. Sign me up. But the cookie diet is perhaps the most ridiculous diet. I have ever heard of in my entire life. 
what this cookie diet is, is they give you a cookie to eat for breakfast and another cookie to eat for lunch. You, you eat these and you drink a whole lot of water and it's supposed to fill you up, right? Like just super expand in your stomach like a sponge and you're supposed to be satiated until dinner. And for dinner, they told you to eat uh, just a healthy dinner. Make sure that you have some fruits and some vegetables. Beyond that, no other guidelines whatsoever. A couple issues here. One, the cookie did not taste like a cookie. The cookie tasted like the sponge on my kitchen sink with a sprinkle of cinnamon and one or two raisins dropped in. So that wasn't the most appetizing thing in the world. And two, there was a complete lack of guidance as far as the other nutrition I was supposed to be getting at night. Just eat a sensible dinner. What is a sensible dinner? Well, make sure that it has some fruits and make sure that it has some vegetables. Okay. Does that mean that I can have an apple and still eat my 10,000 calories at Taco Bell? And so you know, there was just no guidance. And, and, um, I, I, I remember for that, I was just like, I'm going to do my best and I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to lose weight. And I did, but it just became like every other diet where in the long run, as soon as I stopped it, uh, and, and went right back to my old eating habits, it was just like, boom, my waist just exploded again. And as a matter of fact, the cookie diet was the last diet I went on before I had, um, weight loss surgery. It seems though you were more like the fat and salt combo more than the sweet. It didn't seem like you had a real sweet tooth. You weren't eating like candy, cake, cookies, pies, and ice cream. No, definitely not a sweets guy. Definitely a fat and salt guy. Definitely. I, I rarely would eat the dessert. Like I, I did not get sad when they didn't give me the free caramel empanada. Yeah. See, because to me, I, for me, it was sugar and caffeine and fat. So, so like, I, like, I probably have a thousand calories at least every day, just from Coke Slurpees and Dr. Pepper, because I love the sugar caffeine combination. And then, you know, when I think about it, like a Cinnabon is over a thousand calories. All, I mean, it's just so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's funny, like the, the different ways that I guess we're wired and the, the ways that our brain lights up to certain things. Um, my mother, she has a, you know, a sweet tooth. Um, and, and obviously so many other people are, are, are addicted to, you know, sweets and things like that. They're like, I don't need dinner. Just give me the cake and the ice cream and I'm good to go. Uh, my wife, sweet tooth, love her to death, has a sweet tooth. Um, but not, not me. You, you got the fat tooth. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I got the fat. Yeah. <laughs> Well, there, you know, it's just, that's just cause, cause when I saw what you eat, it was like, none of that looks good to me. I mean, what, even if it was vegan, it's like, you know, where's, where are the cookies, you know, where's the cake, yeah. where's it, yeah. you know, that, that's what I would have gone for. So yeah, it's really interesting, but it's still the same addiction. So, you know, and, and Dr. Lyle, Dr. Greg Lyle explains that we, we weren't supposed to have sugar, fat, and salt in the same, at the same time. There's no, there's no foods in nature that have sugar and fat or sugar and salt or fat and salt or sugar, fat, and salt. And that's all restaurant food and processed food is, whether it's vegan or not, it's some combination, some hyperpalatable combination of sugar, fat, and salt that they tweak exactly right so that you can't eat just one. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and there was a, a little bit of sugar in all of that food as well. I mean, there's no doubt about it that those mad food scientists working for Taco Bell in this case, um, you know, no chance that they didn't put a little bit of sugar at least in, in some of those items as well. Again, it's that perfect cocktail. It's that perfect cocktail to get you hooked. Perfect storm. Kim says, do you ever miss Taco Bell? Yeah, so yes, um, but it's, it's a very fleeting kind of craving. Um, so if I'm watching a ball game on TV, right, every Sunday, you can find me glued to the TV watching football. My wife absolutely loves it. God. So anyway, um, when I see a commercial for Taco Bell come on from time to time, doesn't happen every time, but I'll be like, man, that looks really good. And then it's just like, psh, snap out of it. And then just as quickly as the craving came, it subsides. But I always make it a practice to when that happens, think about what would happen if I did go ahead and go back to that drive-through? Like what would happen to me physically? What would happen to my career at this point? Um, and, and so when I weigh the pros and cons here, it's really even, it's not even a debate whatsoever. It's not, it's not. I always think about Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, he was abstinent from heroin for all those years. And then one day he takes a drink and he's using, and then he's dead. I mean, I, I really, I think about him all the time when I'm tempted, you know, because I mean, my brother, you know, even though on the death certificate for my brother who died, like a little bit over 60 years old, it said pancreatic cancer. It was food addiction because how did he get pancreatic cancer? He got it because he was morbidly obese. He was a medical doctor, by the way, number one in his graduating class in Princeton, but he was morbidly obese. 
diabetic, you know, a hypertensive heart disease on 15 medications. And that's what got him pancreatic cancer, but nobody ever puts food addiction on the death certificate in that was what killed him. And my mom as well. We should be talking more about food addiction. I mean, just as a society and and doctors need to realize this. Um, I tell you, my bariatric surgeon um, deals with overweight people all day, every day. This is what he has devoted his entire career to. He's very well known. But he, he even misses this component. And I, I don't know how he, he could have missed it. Um, and after I had lost close to my maximum amount of weight, so I had gotten from that point down from 420 pounds, I was right around 170. And he was like, you're good. You're good. Don't lose any more weight. Now you need to eat a hamburger. Okay. I wasn't even vegan at that point. I was not even vegan. And I knew I was like, wait a minute, that may be the worst piece of advice I have ever gotten from anyone, let alone a doctor. And I I remember, I I wish I would have like spoken up that day. I've talked to him since then, but I wish that I would have spoken up that day to be like, no, man, like, let's talk about Philip Seymour Hoffman. Let's talk about that heroin. Let's talk about falling off the wagon because food is a drug, doc. Food is a drug. You can choose to eat healthier foods, okay? You can absolutely choose to eat healthier foods, but then just as, you know, you could choose water over wine, okay? You, you, can, you can choose kale over a seven-layer burrito, right? But it's so important that you, you stick to that kale, you stick to that water so that you can continue on that path and not have that success that you had derailed and let your health just all go kaput again. But doctors don't get that. The majority of them. And why? Because what I've learned working with the physicians committee is by and large, doctors, unless they seek this out themselves, aren't taught any of it. So I don't even blame my surgeon for being oblivious. I blame, you know, the the, the medical schools, the curriculum. It's, yeah, well, let's let's do something together. Let's really get this out. That's why I do the summits. And this year we're adding more food addiction people to it because it's really not about weight loss because it, it is about, really, that's the underlying thing. You know, if people always say, well, well, how do you get back on the wagon? And I tell them, don't get, don't fall off. I mean, and, and <laughs> I mean, that's my secret is because I, I really am like that cat on the stove. I mean, I had one relapse early on and I'm like, I'm not doing that again. I mean, because mm-hmm. I see so many people lose so many, so much weight, hundreds of pounds and gain it back. And it's like, like you say, it's that one nacho, just don't, it's, you know, don't take the, you know, don't take the first bite. That's the, that's really the answer. Don't do it. Don't do it. But believe me, I, I came close. Um, I, I made the mistake of uh, chasing a girl to Florida after I had lost weight. And um, she was a, someone who I had a crush on in, um, in high school. And then we met up at the reunion and um, we started talking, hit it off, wound up starting dating. Um, and she was really into nutrition too, which worked well. Cause I had just lost all of this weight. And um, she too was unfamiliar with food addiction. So she was telling me about how you could work, you know, certain things into your diet that would otherwise be considered unhealthy. And like, I was really nervous about that. And I mean, I was like right up on that line, but never truly crossed it. So I, uh, you, you just can't, you can't give in. You have to listen to your, your gut. I think that that's really what that, that big um, lesson is there. It's like, you already know what you need to do. So just do it or don't do it in this case. Yeah. So people keep asking what you eat in a day. And I'm wondering, I don't know which, which weight loss surgery you had, but I'm guessing your stomach is a certain size now. So you can't necessarily eat like as much as I do in terms of volume at each meal. Is that correct? Well, yes and no. Um, I, I would say I'm about 90% of the way to a, a normal stomach. Um, initially, after you, I had gastric bypass, ruin why, if you want to get like really specific about it. Initially, after the surgery, right, you, your stomach goes from being, at least mine did, went from being like two, maybe three liters to four ounces, which is about the size of your thumb. Okay. But your stomach is like a balloon. It is super elastic. And over time, it will stretch back out. Why? Because over time, before the surgery, you would already stretch that stomach out. It's just elastic. So it does, you know, get back and you can keep putting more and more food in there. Um, So some of the stuff that I eat is a lot like so when I have my kitchen sink salad at the end of the day, which is, you know, it's it's a bed of greens um, on top of, you know, whatever roasted vegetables, 
that I have in the refrigerator, whatever I've done that week. Typically it's uh, roasted Brussels sprouts, roast sweet potatoes, uh, roasted red peppers, roasted carrots, a um, little bit of uh, grains in there, whether it's quinoa, brown rice, something like that, throw that in there, you know, just mix it all up and go to town. And I mean, I'm talking like, this is a big old salad, right? So um, I, I will crush that with some pita and hummus and be absolutely, you know, fine. But earlier in the day, I will have breakfast, um, which is typically oatmeal and fruit. And um, it's about three quarters of a bowl, but then, you know, a whole banana or strawberries, whatever the case may be on top of that. So that's a pretty good size, but then I'll have a snack typically right after lunch. And lunch is typically like, some sort of a soup uh, with uh, pita and hummus again, like that's just my jam. And then you, you throw, um, throw some baby carrots in there as well. And, and, and you crush that. And then I'll have like, uh, I, I have an air fryer. I do my own roasted chickpeas in there, oil free. Uh, you know, um, I also, uh, I found these little snacks initially, one of our dietitians at the physician's committee introduced me to something called bada bean, which are um, roasted broad beans. Um, and so I kind of find a way to do that uh, oil free as well in the air fryer. And it's just crunchy and it's satiating and, and it's really good. Um, but I'll tell you the interesting thing though, is um, I still very much eat that same thing day after day after day, just as I did before the surgery. I think that that's just the way that I'm wired. You know, a, my wife loves variety. And so oftentimes at night, it's like, I'm always making my salad, but I have to make a second dinner for her. You know, that's always a little bit different. Yeah, I, I think that, I think, I think the variety is the kiss of death for an addict. Oh, wow. I love that statement. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, you get it so well. Holy <laughs> moly. Yeah, pe people don't understand that just because we look trim now doesn't mean that our, our brain has not changed. We are still addicts and we know it every single day, a day at a time, a meal at a time, a bite at a time. And, you know, I just, I'm very grateful for, for abstinence and for getting to live in this body now because I lived in one that wasn't, wasn't serving me. I'm just curious, Chuck, were you heavy as a child or did yeah. that come? Yeah, um, I, I grew up uh, heavy, you know, um, single, single parent household. Uh, my mom was working, so there wasn't always uh, a lot of time after her shift. Um, she would come home, she would pick up my brother and I, uh, we were staying at our grandma's house. And oftentimes, more often than not, we would go through the drive through um, Burger King. And I remember at a young age, you know, probably like second or third grade, I was already getting a double cheeseburger ketchup only um, with, uh, you know, the king size combo meal, um, and always with the orange drink to go with that. Um, and so that's, that's a pretty heavy calorie shot for a kid. And then, but before that at my grandma's house, man, she was old school, right? She did. I, man, I miss grandma. Uh, she was, she was just the absolute best. I mean, chain smoker taught me to play poker when I'm like five years old. Right. And then we would just sit there and she would smoke, play poker. We'd have a ball game on in the background and she would always fix us something, you know, with a ton of fat, you know, and she had this jar. God, she was the greatest. She had this, but so unhealthy. She had a jar of bacon grease on top of the stove and she would cook everything with this grease. I don't care what it was that she was fixing. Somehow bacon grease wound up in it. Like she had this old school coffee percolator and that's how she made her coffee. It wasn't a coffee maker. No, it was like this tin percolator that you would see in the, like a World War II movie or something. And I'm telling you, man, like bacon grease would somehow wind up in that even, you know, so you're having grits, pff, bacon grease. Uh, you're having a hamburger, let's fry that and bacon grease too, whatever the case may be, man. But so you start eating that way and introducing that fat and that salt at that young age. And then over the years, as you continue to eat that more and more and more, you do become hooked, but you don't recognize it right away. Absolutely. You know, I think we're kindred spirits because I learned to play poker at seven years old, which itself is also, and that's an addictive game, by the way. And um, I, I, we're Jewish. So instead of the bacon fat, we had what's called schmaltz. It's the fat that the Jewish word that they make. And then we had that jar with all the schmaltz in it. So it's like kind of the same thing. And so I don't know why, I wish my mom was alive just to ask her, why was I given coffee at four years old? Like, <laughs> I don't understand. You know, I think like she was drinking it and she drank it with sugar and cream. And we know that the dairy is addictive, the sugar is addictive, the caffeine's addictive. And like, she let me taste it and I liked it. And I mean, I had a bad caffeine. That was a big problem, you know? And, and so, yeah, this is so fun talking to you. I feel like, you know, we just, uh, you know, twins almost separated at birth, you know? Do you, oh, yeah. do, do you keep a clean environment? And do you think that's important? 
keep a clay as, as far as a tidy house? Well, you know, I mean, I, no, I meant like not having non-compliant foods in your house. Not ah, having I was foods. like a tidy house, not so much. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but, uh, but as far as a, a clean environment with food, by and large, yes. Um, there are things that my wife eats that I certainly wouldn't touch with a 10 foot pole, but it's also not my place to tell her that she can't eat that. I, I don't want to be an authoritarian for anybody when it comes to food. Like, um, so she's free to eat what she eats. She is vegan, you know, but there are certain foods that, you know, she eats that fall into that junk food vegan category that I just choose to abstain from. So do you, did they bother you? Cause so for me, I, I just, I know myself, I can't allow it in the house, but my husband is so thin and he lost so much weight during the pandemic, not going to the gym that he has to have the nuts. Cause for me, that's a big problem. So we just keep him locked up. If he has them in his office, I never see him because I, I am that sensitive to the environment cues. So, okay. Kindred spirit time. Uh, that is the one food that I cannot have in the house, uh, is dry roasted, unsalted peanuts. I mean, even before I lost weight, I mean, that was just my jam. You roast a peanut, I will eat the whole jar of it. Um, so that is something that I am sensitive to that I do not keep in the house. Um, and so she's not big on nuts either. So that one is not much of an issue. Um, she's more of uh, like uh, the Gardein uh, kind of person or um, uh, sh some vegan chocolates and things like that. But I never had that sweet tooth. But, you know, even before I went plant based, um, I was living with my brother and sister in law right after I had the surgery. And they they very kindly and politely asked me, you know, is it OK if we eat this pizza in front of you? And I I. I always felt like it wasn't my place to say no. Like I just appreciated the fact that they would ask. And so I learned kind of how to just deal with it early on. But if I was truly in a crack den surrounded by nothing but peanuts all day, every day, I, no, I, I probably would be in, in, in deep, deep, deep trouble. Yeah, that's good. Well, but I think the important thing is to know thyself, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's what people need to do. But, but some people wouldn't even ask for, you know, the clean environment. They'll just, they just, and, and, and that's why it's so hard for people when they're, when their family members aren't on board. So that, that's amazing. I love your voice, by the way, you are, you really, I mean, now you have the, you have, you have the face for TV now, but you really were meant for broadcasting. You have just a, and a terrific voice. And there's actually a question, was that impaired at all when you were heavier? Was it harder to have this like beautiful sounding voice or was it always great? No, the, the voice never really changed. Um, luckily, um, I, I took more breaths when I was <laughs> del delivering the broadcasts uh, on WBIG, but that's, that's about it. Um, I, I, you know, my, my father was a, a bit of a, a voice actor and a comedian, so I guess I just inherited those genes from him. Uh, Randy says, were your, were your family members overweight or obese? Oh my goodness gracious, yes. Uh, we, we definitely come from a long line of heavyset people. Um, not so much on my mother's side, although she, she has had her own struggles, but, um, certainly, um, on my father's side, uh, grandma, you know, my poker playing grandma, uh, she definitely, as you might suspect, had herself a bit of a weight problem. Um, and my dad certainly did. He was the one actually who encouraged me to have weight loss surgery in the first place. Um, he, he was very, very, very much overweight, um, for a spell. And I uh, had the surgery, lost a lot of it. I uh, actually became quite thin. And then over time, um, put I, I love them, you know, but put a significant amount of it back on. Um, and so I, I don't want to go that route. But I, I think that as far as being genetically predisposed to uh, being a food addict, I would say, yeah, yeah, definitely inherited those genes. Yeah. You know, I recently interviewed on the show, Dr. Janice Laster, and she's also going to be on the GI Health Summit. And they have these newer types of weight loss surgeries that are not permanent. There's, a, there's about three procedures now they're doing that are about six months where it, it, you have the same kind of effect. They put like a balloon in, but they take it out and they hope that behaviorally you'll learn how to eat. But I find that for some of the people I've known that have gained their weight back, even with, with weight loss surgery, they don't change how they eat. No, no. And, 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 it's, so that goes back to that compulsion. I remember, you know, my dad, again, this was years before I, I had my own procedure. Um, he told me he was stopping to get dinner at Taco Bell for himself after, after he had the surgery. And I remember thinking like, why would, would you do that? And I asked him that and he's like, just because it's easier to digest. I was like, oh my gosh. So 
I, I really wish that they, they would teach you that component. And when you, here's the, here's another thing about this surgery is, um, as you're, you're expanding your stomach, like if you overeat beyond just becoming physically sick, like it, it genuinely hurts and you have to force that food down. And that's where that addiction, that compulsion comes into play. Um, and, and it's so much easier to do that when you're eating high fat food, high salt food, sugary food, um, with, a whole bunch of calories, but not a whole lot of nutrient density to it. Um, so painfully, yeah, man, you can, you can put all that weight back on. And I would be personally without, uh, you know, some serious, serious, serious diet modifications and an explanation about long-term abstinence from those types of foods. If you're only having a short-term procedure like that, you, you're only going to have short-term success guaranteed. Did you ever uh, struggle with other things? like maybe smoking or alcohol. I never drank alcohol, but believe it or not, I used to smoke, which is like, I can't believe it because I'm an asthmatic, you know? Mm, yeah. Uh, I, I had about a pack and a day habit, a pack and a half a day habit um, for, for a couple of years. And then um, very uh, er, well, early on in my life, my late teens, early twenties, I was, uh, I was quite a fan of uh, marijuana as well. Uh, couldn't, couldn't just smoke on the weekend. Like I was getting high five, six, seven times a day, every day. Um, I was like a full on functional pothead. And so like, it's, it's just that, that pleasure center in my brain. When, when my brain gets a hit of something it likes, it, it keeps telling me, it's like, push that pleasure button again, push it again and again and again and again. And that's how you get up to 420 pounds. That's how you're smoking a pound of weed a month. Like it's, <laughs> it, you know, and, and, and buying your cigarettes from Russia because they're cheaper. True story. It's funny. I never got into pot. Uh, I'm, glad, I'm grateful because I just feel like I have an addictive personality. That's why I don't like to go to casinos. You know, even when I went to Vegas, I would, there was always a way to, to avoid, I just feel like I could get addicted to anything. You know, Sephora, that was my addiction for a while. I used to live by the mall. I'm so thankful I don't live near any stores now. But I remember one time I did try pot in my 20s and I just, I didn't like the feeling of being out of control because I could not stop eating. Mm, that'll do it. That, that, that will give you the munchies. Yeah, that's funny. So Cindy has a question. And before I ask it, I just want to thank Cindy quick because she gave me this wonderful shirt that I'm wearing today. I'll show you what one looks like when it's not on. She got one for my husband too. And I'm going to provide, it says eat plants for the win. And it comes in a bag too. And I'm going to be putting a link in the show notes. So thank you so much for sending that. So actually, if this question is too long, we can save this for your interview for the summit. But she said, can Chuck talk a little bit about how he went from eating omnivorous to a plant-based diet? I understand that he changed after he had dropped the weight to 177. Why did he choose to go plant-based rather than continue with an omnivorous diet? Fantastic question. And that was an awesome t-shirt and awesome tote bag, by the way. Um, so uh, it was a funny story. Um, after I lost a lot of weight, uh, I, I got this surge of confidence. And I, I kind of asked myself a question that you get asked as a kid. And that is, what do you want to be when you grow up? So here I am in my mid-20s. Um, and, and I felt like I was at one point, not even going to live to see 30, but now here I am 27, 28 years old, and I've got my whole life ahead of me again. So what do I want to do with it? And I always, always, always loved sports. And so I just kind of leaned on my media background and then I leaned on my passion for sports and I started, well, that would be my dog. Um, the <laughs> I thought it was my dog. No, no, no. That, that That's Rudy downstairs. I, I swear we're like, we're like, you were like related. Everything. Oh yeah. So my much. last dog's name was Bailey, by the way. So, um, oh my God, I know Beagle. Bailey. I love you so much. I can't believe it. <laughs> and you wear my favorite color all the time and you look so good in it. Oh, thank you. Um, yep. But anyway, so um, I, I start my own sports media company and I uh, wind up uh, providing NFL coverage for uh, local media outlets here um, in the DC area and, and was covering the football team and um, got to befriend a number of players. And then one thing led to another and then CBS eventually called and uh, hired me. And so a number of years after that happened, um, I was interviewing a professional wrestler by the name of Austin Aries, who uh, had just released a book about his plant powered journey to the top of the wrestling industry. And he was like, man, you should really give this thing a try. You know, you're so focused on your health. Well, let's, let's get your health to the next level. So go watch what the health go watch uh, forks over knives, you know, the, the typical documentary slate. And, uh, and I did, and it was overnight then that, that I made the switch and never looked back. And 
I lost the rest of that weight uh, that came down uh, all the way to 140 now. And um, I, I'm just so confident now that I will not go back to the way that I was because that it's just so far from what my current menu is. And there will have to be some sort of significant trauma or, or just, I mean, left field curveball that life throws you to really throw me off track. And even then, I'm not sure that whatever force that is would be strong enough to push me off of the tracks. I never want to say that I'm overly confident, but with a plant-based diet, certainly, uh, I feel like I'm never going to be that 420 pound person again. So going plant-based, I credit Austin Aries. Nice. That's, that's wonderful. Do you, do you exercise? I do, but not, um, no, I'm not a gym rat by any stretch of the imagination. I don't go out and run miles a day. I'm not one of those people who lost a lot of weight and decided to run marathons. Um, I, I walk, uh, that is what worked for me, uh, when I was losing weight, uh, was simply, it got to a point where you, you talk about addiction, you know, I, every day on my lunch break, I would just walk a little bit. So at first I could only walk across the street and I would, and I would sit down and I would just you know, sit there for 15 minutes or so, gather my thoughts, walk back. Eventually I was able to walk around the block as the weight was coming off and then two blocks and then three, and then it was a mile. That was a momentous day. And eventually every day on my lunch break, it got to a point where I was walking five miles a day and it did not matter if it was pouring down rain, if it was sleeting, if there was a foot of snow on the ground, if it was just a sheet of ice, didn't matter. I was out there walking. I had to get my steps in. So that's really how, um, I, I turned to exercise because I also associated, maybe this was the same for you as well. I don't know. I associated gyms with every failed diet that I ever had before because I equated gyms, you know, it was that prerequisite. You have to eat better. You have to exercise more. And the only way to exercise more is to go to a gym. So I was like, I I'm going to do things differently now. And gym to me equaled diet failure. So no. And now I just make sure that I'm still walking, um, not five miles every day um, on my lunch break, but uh, certainly, you know, every time, you know, I have to use the restroom, you know, I will walk up a flight of stairs, do something silly like that. And the, the little tips like park in the last spot in the parking lot um, and, and things like that, but just generally stay organically active. That's the way that I put it. And that's how, you know, I keep the majority of the weight uh, off, at least from a physical standpoint. You're very consistent is what you're saying. Very much so. Creature are, of habit. Are you in the national weight control registry? No, we need to get you in there because I just interviewed James Hill and they have, they need more men and everything you're saying to me is exactly what he said in the interview about people that are successful losers, meaning keeping the weight off. Yeah. Well, I'm going to hook you up with him because I, we need to hear, they need to, they need to study us like lab rats because that's, what's going to apparently going to help people. To, but it sounds like, you know, we all kind of do the same thing. We're kind of, you know, we have good habits now we're abstinent, things like that. So here's a fun question. Where did it go? It was about your wonderful job uh, from Lori. Are you the first and only host of the exam room live? How did you come to work for PCRM and maybe tell people about the show and how they can watch it just in case a few of them haven't heard about it? I am the host, uh, the, the one and only. Um, working with PCRM was something that I had always had an eye on even before I was plant-based 100%. Um, because when I was still covering football full-time, um, I was doing a, a local radio show with a player here, a um, gentleman by the name of Adam Carricker. He's actually the one that gave me the nickname, the weight loss champion. And I'm kind of of the belief, like if an NFL player who makes millions of dollars and has that level of celebrity is going to call you something like just own the name, man. Like to me, like that's, that's just the coolest thing ever growing up such a football fan. But anyway, so PCRM actually reached out to us, um, they caught wind of the show and how uh, we would often talk about diet, nutrition, and weight loss and introduced us to the whole idea of plant-based eating. And we did a little bit of a campaign about healthy eating, not 100% plant-based. But then years later, um, when I was just a, a news reporter at that point, reporting um, you know, death and destruction all day, every day, and I just got so burnt out. Um, matter of fact, I was anchoring for NBC at that point, NBC News Radio. And I just... I. I couldn't take it mentally anymore. I was like, I need to do something more positive with my life. So I approached PCRM with the idea of starting a podcast and we had a series of meetings. Um, and, um, you know, so 
within three or four meetings, we, we had an agreement in place and then the shows began um, a few uh, a, a few weeks later. Um, and interestingly, here's, here's a fun note. Um, the exam room was not the original title of the show. The original title was going to be Plant-Based Rx and it only became the exam room literally two hours before we recorded our first episode. That's great. Well, I love the show. And if you guys haven't checked it out, I'll put some links in the show notes. And even if you can't watch live, it's every day at noon Eastern time, right? Yeah. 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 Monday through Friday, noon Eastern over on the Physicians Committee's Facebook page and YouTube channel. And then, um, so that's about seven months old. We started that really in, in response to the pandemic. That was Dr. Barnard's idea to do a daily news show. And it's kind of morphed into what it has become today. We still have health headlines at the top where I get to talk about, you know, the latest on the pandemic, as well as throw in, uh, you know, a couple nutrition studies in there, just what's breaking that day. So I still get to rely on my news chops, which is fun for me. But then the original exam room podcast comes out Tuesdays and Thursdays. And you can find that on Apple podcast or Spotify, wherever you get your favorite shows from. So go ahead and, and check that out as well. Um, and we've got, you know, close to 4 million downloads at this point, And it's, it's really taken off and, you know, humbling to know that that's one of the most downloaded nutrition podcasts out there. Um, and to me, it means that a lot of people are paying attention to this. I call it life-saving and certainly life-changing information. And so every every week when we see you know the numbers come in, it's like, man, you know, look at look at how many people are are getting this information right now. And you know, you just know that it's not stopping at the person who listens to the podcast. They then tell their friends and family about it. And so, you know, kind of slowly but surely, that that message is getting out there, and it's doing a lot of good. I didn't realize. So the podcast is different than the daily show. Yeah, man. They keep me busy. They keep well, me busy. Chef I AJ. did not know that. So I'm going to check that out for sure. Well, you know what? I could keep talking to you because you're, you're just so fun to talk to and passionate and interesting. Uh, but I want to save some of it for our summit interview. But I want to say, in addition to being the weight loss champion, what I love about you is now you're like a vegan champion too, because you know that that's to me just as important with the work you're doing now after losing the weight. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. The vegan, the vegan weight loss champion. I can dig I, it. I can dig it. <laughs> I, 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 I say put, let's put, let's put a little, like the little sign where you add the little thing, then vegan weight loss champion. Why not? Let's, I can dig it. I can all dig right. It. This is great. I can't wait till we do our summit interview because I know you're gonna, you're gonna crush it. So thank you so much, Chuck Carroll. You are just amazing. And thank all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when my guest will be Dr. Riz. He is an amazing surgeon who is plant-based from Texas. And thank you so much for the work you do and for understanding food addiction. It is my pleasure. And remember, variety is the spice of addiction. Chef AJ. <laughs> Bye, Chuck.